What a delight it is to be here with you. Florida camp meeting, which I call the queen of camp meetings in the church of God. It is a, a great place. You know, I've been preaching camp meetings here since the days that you had open air camp meetings. And uh, ten nights, I remember when you went from ten days to seven days, some of them thought you backslid. And maybe you did three days. I don't know. But uh, there have been some wonderful and ma marvelous things that have happened here. And I've had the privilege of being here with you for 12 of those as night speaker. And, of course, many more times as a representative or speaking during a day service. What a pleasure it is to be with your overseer and the state staff here to, again, share in this meeting. Last night I was deeply touched. You know, when an evangelist has a burden for the lost, that is a rare quality in our day. Did you hear what I said? And I, I sensed a real burden for the lost. I also sensed a deep yearning in the heart of our night speaker for a move of God, a, a new vision of God in the church. And that's great. This morning I was deeply touched by Brother Barnett. Of course, Ward, back in the VIP room, the boy said, I'd hate to follow that. Well, I don't plan to follow it. I'm just going to join it. Amen. I'm just going to join it. You know, because when I walked in last evening, I sensed a move of the Holy Spirit. You say, explain that to us, Brother Hughes. Does the, does the Spirit dwell in certain places? Yes, I believe the Spirit comes to be with the people who will open up their hearts to Him. And I, I sense a yearning and a longing, the fullness of God's Spirit in this place. And I want to join that. I want to be a part of it. I feel broken in my spirit today because I realize that we have a very brief window of time to minister. That the time of ministry is short and there's a gargantuan task, there is a Herculean task that is before us that God will help us. Shall we pray? Our Father, I pray for a touch today that makes preaching effective. You know what the people have need of. And you know what is stored away in my heart. and You know the things about which you've spoken to me. And I want you to have your full right away. Lead me in the way that you want me to go. And make known yourself to your people today. To the glory of God the Father. And to the praise and honor of Him who loved us. And gave Himself for us. And Amen. If you have your Bibles, I would like to draw your attention to uh, Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, starting with verse 12. And would like for you to listen as I read in your hearing verses 12 through 17. And then I want to point out verse 18. I want to point out verse 21, verse 23, and verse 28. Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all of your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and these that suck the breasts, and let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. 
And give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen shall rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Now he's talking about antecedent conditions for an outpouring of the Spirit. He said, When you do these things, then something will happen. Notice verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for His land and pity His people. Notice verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. And notice verse 23. It said, Be glad then. When? Then. When you have fulfilled the requirements. When you have fulfilled the antecedent conditions. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He hath given you the form and rain moderately, and He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And then verse 28, the old familiar Pentecostal verse that all of us know so well. And it shall come to pass when? Afterward. Afterward, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. May God add to His Word, the blessings and results that come from the preaching of the Word. I want to talk to you about turning to God as an antecedent condition to an outpouring of the Spirit. A lot of people are crying out for an outpouring. They realize that these are the last days and that there is to be a last day's outpouring. But they're trying to bypass the requirements. You can't get to Pentecost except you go by Calvary. I've said that many, many times. You can't get to the outpouring of the Spirit unless you meet the requirements. Notice what he said. Turn ye even to me with all of your heart. The history of Israel was one of straying and returning. Time and time again we Read about Jeremiah said, Return unto me, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. And Hosea said, uh, I will heal their backslidings, and I will love them freely. And then Amos said, They will not frame their doings to turn unto the Lord. And then Hosea again said, They slide back like a backsliding heifer. Those of you who are country boys and country girls, you know what it is to load a heifer on a truck or load a heifer on a wagon and how a heifer will back up on you. Now, to some people, they don't understand that when I talk about a heifer. They think that uh, cows sit on bottles and give milk. But uh, they don't understand that. But uh, those of you who had the country experience, I've had that experience trying to load a heifer on a wagon. And he said, that's the way Israel was, trying to back up when they should have been going forward. And then Malachi again called Israel back and said, return unto me and I will return unto you. But the people cried out and said, wherein shall we return? But then God told them that they would return. He had opened the windows of heaven and poured them out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. You see, it was contingent upon the returning to Him. Proverbs 1 and 23 said, Turn ye even unto me, and I will, behold, I will pour out my Spirit unto you and make known unto you my words. Time and time again, He said, When you turn, I will pour. When you turn, I will bless. When you turn, I will fill. Hallelujah. That's my message today of, of turning Back to him. But you know the, the, the strange thing and the sad thing is that many of the people don't realize where they are. Here was Israel. They said, wherein shall we return? In other words, we're all right. We're getting along fine. There was a Laodicean spirit that existed there. And there are people sitting in our congregations today who don't realize that they have gone back on God. They've allowed their experience to uh, regress and they've allowed their experience uh, to fade without being conscious of it. You know, a lot of people are like Samson was. 
Samson went out, the Bible said, and shook himself as before. He still had the shakes, but there wasn't any result. And there are a lot of people still going through the Pentecostal motions, but they don't have the results. They don't have the manifestation. And they don't have the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. They're going through the actions of Pentecost. They are nominal Pentecostals. They're Pentecostal in name only and not from the heart. You know, a lot of the performances we have these days are just going through the actions. You know, I, I'm a praise person. I like to magnify the Lord and praise the Lord. But, you know, praise can become just a perfunctory act. It can become something that you just go through without it ever going through you. It's got to go through you if it's going to have an effect. There are a lot of people today who are like a metallic fountain. That the water comes through the fountain, but the fountain never fills the water. And they're trafficking, as Vance Havner said, in unfelt truths. But it's time that we realize that it must come from the heart. Turn to me with all of your heart, he said. A lot of performance going on these days in the church. People in the congregation are spectators and the choir are the performers. And, and the man at the pulpit is the performer. There's a performance spirit, an entertainment spirit that exists in so many places. A lot of the singing is entertaining. In fact, some Pentecostal singing has become a performing art. A performing art. We're going to show you what we can do. Look at us. Oh my God, friend. You don't worship God by performance. You worship God through the Spirit. God is a Spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I don't need a dance team to show me how to dance. I can dance under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That's right. I don't need somebody with leotards to show me how I'm supposed to act as a Pentecostal. You can't pour the Holy Ghost into leotards. What I want is a movement of the power of the Holy Ghost to fall upon His people today. I'm not looking for painted fire. I don't want false fire. I don't want uh, something that is not real. I want a demonstration of the fire, the forked flames uh, of Pentecost. Oh, blessed be God forever and ever. You see, you backslide in your heart before you ever backslide in action. And I want to ask the congregation with me today. And remember, you don't preach like this without examining your own heart. I'm not a Greek God that's upon a pedestal someplace, never struggles, never have to examine my own heart and look at myself. But I want us to look at our hearts today as we sit here to worship. You know, the Bible said in Acts 7 and 39, and they turned back again in their hearts into Egypt. You see, you can have already left and turned back in your heart before you ever put it into action. Amen? Jesus Christ talking about the group during the days of Isaiah, about the Pharisees in His day in Matthew 15 and 8. He said, This people draw nigh to Me with their mouths, honors Me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It said they were going through the form of worship, but really worship wasn't going through them. Amen? Now notice, Ezekiel said the same thing. They said, They come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as thy people, and they hear thy words, but will not do them. And he said, with their mouth they show forth much love, but their heart goeth after covetousness. You hear what I'm saying? And listen, the way they looked at the prophet, the way they looked at the preacher, 
the same way that a preacher is being viewed today. Thou art unto them as a lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice or can play well on an instrument, but they hear the words of the Lord and will not do them. See, the expectations of the pulpit of our day. Now, I'm going to see if he can bless me. You know, I, I have people as I travel around to camp meetings, they say, preach me happy, Brother Hughes. Some people don't need to be preached happy. They need to be preached sad. They need to look into their own hearts. They, they need to examine their hearts whether they be in the faith. They need to examine themselves and look at themselves. As Second John verse 8 said, look to yourselves. It's time that we look inside. What does God think about us? You see, it said the personality is what uh, people think about you and your character is what your wife knows about you. You see, but I want to tell you, your real character is what God knows about you. The Bible said, God who knoweth our hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as He did unto us. And when God sees a heart that is open to Him, all you've got to do is lean back in His arms in sweet repose, and He will fill that heart with His glory and with His power. Amen. Turn unto Him with all of your heart. For in Proverbs 4 and 23... Keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Turn unto Him with all of your heart, for in Matthew 6 and 21, for your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Meditate on that, if you will, please. Where is your heart today? Where is your heart today? And then in Matthew 12 and 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What is your conversation what, what is your real conversation? Then in Proverbs 23 and 7, it said, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's the reason why I'm saying, Turn unto the Lord with all of your heart. See, turn to the Lord with all of your heart because your heart is the seat of your will. One. Your heart is the seat of your mind or your thinking. Number three. Your heart is is the seat of your affection. You ma a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let's notice the seat of our will. One person said, Our wills are ours to make them thine. He does not take our will away from us, but he says, I want your will to be synchronized with my will. Now, said, let the mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. And, and what kind of a will did he have? He didn't want to go to the cross. He drew back from the cross. The cross was an ignominious, shameful thing. I hear him in the garden saying, Father, I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to suffer. Already I'm going through such pain until purplish hue in the form of sweat, has been forced out of my pores. And I, I am in agony. He said he agonized. He was a great agony. That I don't want to have to go to the cross. But he said, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Thine be done. Oh, our wills need to be brought under subjection. But you know the Bible said in Proverbs 14 and 14, a backslider in heart is filled with his own ways. And there are a lot of people who will rule or ruin in the church these days. I see so many little groups in the church of people who want to take charge, of the take charge group, carnal in their spirit, little cliques. Until, in fact, I, I want to ask some of the churches where I go, how are you clicking? Just a little click here and a little click there. But they're filled with their own ways. They will split to rule or ruin. They'll take charge or else. That spirit is contrary to the Spirit of God. There needs to come a brokenness of that will. He's nigh unto them of a broken heart, save as such of a contrite spirit. He needs you to be broken in His presence in order to use you. He had to break the necks of the turtle doves and the pigeons to offer them. The sacrifices had to be divided and, and put in parts in order for Him to bless them. And the bread had to be broken before 
before the Lord can bless it. God, break our church today. Break the hearts of our people. Break us and bre- break me, oh God, in your presence so that you can pour your spirit down upon me. A brokenness before him. Listen to this. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, he said, Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. We are faced with a spirit of rebellion. Now listen to this. I had an overseer to tell me this week. He said he went to a church to have a business meeting and they stood up and challenged him. Well, you know, that's nothing new. We've been having people stand up challenges for years. But these are church members challenging. One of the church members stood up And he said, why do you have to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Why do you have to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance? He said, well, you don't have to every moment of the day. But this person challenged why you even needed experience. I'm talking about the church of God. I'm not talking about some church way out here somewhere. Another one stood up and he said, I don't believe it's wrong to smoke. And said, our former pastor told us to come on in. And we'd take care of that later. And the challenge is coming there. And people have their own ways and they will have their way or else. God has a program and God has a conformity. The Bible said in the last days they would despise government and speak evil of dignities. And literally that is translated that they will rebel against constituted authority. And that spirit of rebellion is on in the land. That is contrary to God. And the Bible said it is as witchcraft. If I were to say to you, bow down and worship the devil, I would say to you, consult a palmist or an astrologer or the signs of zodiac or join a coven coven of witches that say, are you kidding? But then how does God look at your rebellion? He says, it's as the sin of witchcraft. And I look at my own heart. I want to tell you this. I don't care who you are. You're subject to somebody. Robert White is not an entity in himself. He is subject to somebody. I am subject to somebody. And you say, well, I'm not subject to anybody. Oh, yes, you're subject to every other member in your local congregation. The Bible said, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. We are subject one to another. We're members of the body of Christ. We're members in particular. And we're to care for one another. Amen? Oh, God, give us that spirit of submission. You say, but I know I'm right. Oh, yes, I know I'm right. But there comes a time when you said, yes, I have spoken, but I stand back and I let the majority rule. I let, And somewhere down the line, if you're right, they'll find it out. Somewhere down the line, if you're right, they'll find it out. And then he said, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Here, a backslider in heart is filled with his own ways. Idolatry. If I were to tell you that, oh, it's all right, go ahead and bow down to a graven image, bow down to an idol god of wood, stone, or brass, you say, are you kidding? But he said, when you're stubborn and will not allow God's church to move forward and will not allow the congregation to take the church forward and allow the Holy Spirit to move. He said, if you're one filled with iniquity and you're as an idolater, an idolater, that puts it in a little different light, doesn't it? Oh my God. So turn to me with all of your heart because it's a seat of your will. 
Father, will you break us in the church of God? Will you break us in the pulpit? Will you break us in the pew? So that we can do your will together. Then turn to me with all of your heart because seed of your mind, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, the Bible says in Romans 8, 5 through 8, he said, they that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. And they that are after the flesh, the things of the flesh. And he said that the, to be carnally minded is, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And said, the carnal mind is enmity against God, not subject unto the law of God, neither indeed can be. And they that are after the flesh cannot please God. Our thinking has to be controlled. I mean, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, I, I, I want to help some people here. And I think one of the greatest tragedies of all time is when somebody who has influence as a pastor or a church leader falls. My wife tells me, she said, and she's here today somewhere, Thank you, honey, for your prayers. She said, I've prayed that if you were ever going to bring a reproach on the church, that God would kill you and take you before that happens. And that's the way I feel, too. That's the way I feel, too. And I've had people say to me, he caused me to fall. She caused me to fall. If a man is tempted, he is what? He's done what? Drawn away of whose lust? The lust of some woman? The lust of some man? No, of his own lust. And enticed. That's where it comes. It, it's your lust. But you say, Brother Hughes, I backslid because, you know, I, I, I had temptation come my way. And, and, uh, and, and I backslid. No, not if you didn't entertain the temptation. Not if you didn't yield to the temptation. Not if you didn't let the lust conceive in your heart. You didn't backslide. Amen? And there are a lot of people who are giving up. If you have stumbled, if you did fall. He said, little children, I say unto you, sin not. I don't teach you sinning religion. But he said to sin not. But said, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And if you happen to fall, don't just lie there in the mud. Get up and wash yourself off and go back to Calvary. If you happen to stumble, don't just lie in the dust. Brush yourself off and run back to the fountain that flows from Emmanuel's veins and let Him restore you. In the many years that I've counseled with pastors and, and people who have had the unfortunate experience of falling by the wayside. I've had them to tell me this. Now listen to this. It was at a time when I was fasting the most and praying the most. And I know that sometimes you say, well, if you'd fast and if you'd pray, it wouldn't happen. But when was Jesus tempted the most? After He had fasted for 40 days. See, the devil knows when you're depleted. He knows when you've given out everything that you have. He knows when you've worked on that church until it just seems like that everything is gone. He understands that. And the old dirty rotten snake takes advantage of you. He takes advantage of you. But the way Jesus encountered him was, It is written, it is written, it is written, the Word says this, the Word says that, the Word says the other... Get out of here, devil! Send the angels, Lord, to minister to me. Amen? So, it's not enough to fast and pray. When you leave out of your house of a morning, you've got to say, I've made up my mind. No she-devil, nor he-devil. Come on now. No Adam and Steve. Go to bother. Here I go, Lord. I've set my mind. I've set my heart on things about. I don't have a double mind today. 
I know where I'm going. Move out of here, devil. Job 31 and 1 says, I have made a covenant with mine eyes, therefore I will not think on a maid. That doesn't mean you can't admire beauty. That doesn't mean that you can't admire a handsome man. My wife and I were riding along this week Sure, I admire handsome men. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't think too well of her if she didn't admire handsome men. She couldn't admire me. But, uh, but, I, but I, I, I said, that's all right to admire a handsome man. It's all right for me to admire a beautiful lady. But I don't have to lust. I don't have to lust after them. The Bible said in Matthew 5 and 28, He that looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. When you look upon a person and you say, if I had an opportunity, I would meet with that person. You've already committed adultery in your heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are of good report, whatsoever things are lovely, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what do you say? Think on these things. Amen. Those are the things to meditate upon. Oh my. Then, seed of your affection. You know, do you ever realize that love and hate are emotions? They're strong emotions. They are extreme emotions. Love and hate. I have come to realize that revival is a matter of relationships. Do you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes evangelists will come and they struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle trying to get the church to have a revival. But then there are times when a congregation bonds. They fuse together. They settle their differences. And an evangelist doesn't even have to come. They just lean back in his arms and the, the Holy Spirit falls. Somebody said, I don't know why the Holy Spirit fell. In the atmosphere of unity and praise, He falls upon the congregation can you say amen? Notice in Mark eleven twenty five and 26, it said, When you stand praying, if you have aught against any, forgive, that your Father which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. For if you will not forgive them that trespass against you, then your Father which is in heaven will not forgive your trespasses. An unforgiving spirit is what is hindering the move of God in our congregations. God will not. He says, I will not forgive you until you forgive. He said, my forgiveness to you is premised upon your forgiveness. He said, forgive them like I forgive you. And if you don't, I'll not forgive you of your trespasses. There is an unforgiving spirit prevailing in a lot of our churches. I know there are a lot of hurt people, but you cannot nurse your hurts. You can't go on a pity party. And, uh, and expect God to use you. I know a wounded man is harder to be won than a strong city. I understand all of that. But on top of all of that, we're to forgive if it's 70 times 7. 
Amen. We're to forgive. The Bible said in Ephesians 5, 4 and 32, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, that there would be a tenderness flow through our congregations, wherefore the forgiving spirit would grip us. But I know what you're saying. I'm not the one that caused the hurt. Well, the Bible says that when you go to the altar and you find there that some brother hath ought against you, leave your gift at the altar and go and fix it up with the brother. Amen? Oh, sure. I had an experience just a few weeks ago. There was one of my brothers who hadn't been treating me right. And I'd loved him for many, many years, prominent preacher. I called him and I said, say, I want to have breakfast with you. He said, can't have breakfast with you. He said, I got to go out of town. I said, okay, when you come back, I want to have breakfast with you. Later on that day, he called and he says, I'll come to see you. And uh, I said, where? He said, I'll come to your office. And he got there. He said, my wife told me that I'd better come see you. Thank God for wives. I will say this, the hardest job that I have to do is to ask my wife to forgive me. Oh, macho Hugh, you know. But you know, there are times if I want to preach good, I got to do that. I got to say, honey, I got to preach tonight. Will you forgive me for speaking sharply to you? Right. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you better get to knowing what I'm talking about. The reason why you're having that hard struggle in the pulpit. Amen. But he came to my office and, and I said, why are you so cold to me? We've been brothers for many, many years. And he said, you've abused me. Well, I said, tell me how I've abused you. I said, I want to know. He said, if I were to tell you you'd, you, you'd think it was petty. So he said, I'm not going to tell you. I said, yes, I want you. I said, quit tiptoeing through the tulips. And I said, hit me right between the eyes. Will you do that? I never could get him just to come out and tell me. Until we had struggled together for a while and I, I just stopped. I said, now, I don't know what you're talking about. And I don't, I don't to this day. But I said, it's real to you. And I'm not going to say if I have abused you or if I have hurt you. I would tears in my eyes. I have hurt you. Would you forgive me for hurting you? And he said, yes. I don't know what his attitude is. But I know one thing. Everything's clear. It's clear here. My son asked me, I'd done two or three things like that, and my son asked, Daddy said, why do you do that? i tell you why I do it. When I stand before you here today, I don't want anything between me and my God. And if I knew there was somebody here who was offended today, I'd do that to you. Because I want the blessings of God upon the church, and I want the blessings of God in the congregation of the righteous. next thing is a spirit of bitterness permeates the congregation of God today. A spirit of bitterness. I've had people tell me, but oh, I grieved the Holy Spirit last night. Said I felt like running and, and I didn't run. Well, I don't know that you grieved the Holy Spirit by failing to run. You just didn't get a good blessing. You just uh, didn't get a good physical uh, catharsis. I, I'm not so sure that that you grieve the Holy Spirit when you didn't run last night. But I'll tell you something, we'll grieve the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians 4 and 30 said, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. When you have clamor and evil speaking and bitterness and the venom of bitterness in your heart, you grieve the Holy Ghost. And when you grieve the Holy Ghost and quench the Holy Ghost, He will not pour out His Spirit upon you. 
Can you say amen? Oh, God, help us. James 3 and 14 says, Let all bitter envy and strife in your hearts. See, all of that is to be said, glory not in that and lie not against the truth. People that have that in their hearts and they think that they're getting along all right and making it all right, it's bitterness that's in their heart. I wonder how much the Spirit is hindered in our local congregations because of bitterness that we have. Most all of you can quote Hebrews twelve fourteen: Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Can't you? Tell me what the next verse is. Looking diligently, lest any fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I had a preacher to tell me. He says, I'm bitter, but I'm not hurting anybody but myself. The Bible says that when you get bitter, that many are defiled. Many are defiled. I've seen homes where they're divided and against the church and the children are against the church because of the bitterness of the family. You, you can't be bitter alone in the church. You can't be bitter by yourself. If you're bitter, it's because that you've allowed the thing to canker in your own heart and you're going to defile somebody else. I don't want to be responsible for defiling somebody else. I want God to free us of the bitterness. Cleanse our hearts today and free us of the bitterness that exists. Listen to this. It said, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You know, bitterness in families today in our church. And people come and sit. And that's the reason why they don't receive a blessing. Because there's bitterness between the husband and the wife. He said, be not bitter against them. Remove that bitterness, Lord. And let the sweetness of the Holy Spirit, let the sweetness of the rose of Sharon, let the sweetness of the lily of the valley, let the sweetness of the plant of renown, let the sweetness of the anointing oil, let the aroma of the Holy Ghost flow in our congregation again. I know what you're saying. Brother Hughes came to our camp meeting and started meddling. If you can't find it here, name it whatever you want to name it. Amen? And then I'm talking about a seat of affection. Grudge not one against another, brethren. The Bible says in James 5 and 9, Grudge not one against another, lest you be condemned. It said, For the judge standeth before the door. And then be ye also patient and establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudging means murmuring or complaining against one another. Here's what he said. He said, Don't hold grudges in your heart. Because the judge has got his hand on the doorknob and said, be patient and wait for it because he's ready to leap from the battlements of glory. Said he's coming again. Hallelujah. I tell you, I want to be ready. Don't you want to be ready when he comes? I want to clear out everything. You cannot harbor these things in your heart and have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? What time is it? Can you tell me what time it is? A quarter after twelve? Great Lord. You're, you're kidding me, aren't you? I stayed too long on that one point. Oh my God, oh. But you're looking at a preacher who wants an outpouring of the Spirit. 
See, congregations so divided and people warring and fighting against one another. When it's come wars and fighting among them, come they not of your own lust? And God cannot. He, he will not. He not only cannot, He will not pour out His Spirit until the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace is restored in the church. He will not do it. But let it happen to us, oh God. Let something happen here today that will take care of that. Briefly, and I'm not going to preach the full next point. This is a series of sermons that I preach. But let me just say something about the next point because my lovely little wife is with me. She said, turn unto the Lord with fasting. When you, Verla, and I first got married, she had, for some reason, not been accustomed to fasting. And in evangelistic work, I would fast quite frequently. And I would come to the table and I would say, I don't feel like I can eat today. And I had a little phrase that I said, I'd feel like a criminal if I ate today. And she said, I don't understand you. Why didn't you tell me yesterday? Well, then, you know, well, I got older in the Lord and, and married longer. I had a little more sense than I did tell her ahead of time. Occasionally, it was the Lord put it on me there. But she said, I don't understand that. We were in a little house trailer. She fixed a beautiful, sumptuous repast for just the two of us put it out on the table and I said how about you praying for us honey she said alright and she started to cry I said what's wrong she said I can't eat she said I'd feel like a criminal if I ate today we were in a revival at Greenville South Carolina Building seated 1,500, and there were 1,500 people there. We'd been going several nights, but the meeting had not broken. They had 120 seats in the choir. She was singing in the choir that night. I'll never forget. She had a black patent leather pocketbook on one arm and a convention book in the hand. And along about the middle of the song service, I heard a scream that sounded like a Comanche Indian. Now, you've got to understand, she is a little quiet, reserved, retiring lady. She's not a forward lady. But, and I saw her pocketbook went one way and the songbook went the other and she stood out on the edge of the platform. I thought, what in the world's happening? And she held up her hand and prophesied. She said, five shall receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost here tonight. And I thought, oh God, we're ruined. We're going to have to leave. And conviction fell and the altar filled up and if you've ever seen an evangelist pray, I said, oh God, there's number one. Oh God, there's number two. And when number five, I said, thank you, Lord, we get to stay. But what I'm saying to you, here's a little lady who turned in fasting and God made a prophetess out of her. God's looking for people who will turn to Him with all of their heart and turn to Him in fasting. There are just some things that you cannot do unless you attach fasting to your prayer. Something. This kind cometh cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting, Jesus said in Mark 9 and 29. There are some things that cannot happen. There is that extra dimension. It was when... Paul and Barnabas were ministering unto the Lord in prayer and fasting that the Holy Ghost spoke and said for them to be sent forth. And the Holy Ghost sent them forth because they were praying and fasting before the Lord. I want to tell you when I get cold in my prayer life and and when I don't feel like reading the Bible, when when I don't feel like doing some of the things that I know I'm supposed to do, I begin to fast before Him. And the psalmist said, when I fasted, prayer returned into my own bosom. I've had people, and I'm hastening to a close, I've had people say, I don't believe in fasting for things. I do. I believe in fasting for things. In Ezra 8 and 21 and verses 23, he said, And then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God 
to seek Him for what is right for us and for our little ones and for all of our substance. He said, he said I wanted to fast to see what was right for us. I want to tell you, church, this church, the church of God, needs to be lying upon its face to see what is right for the church of God in these days. What is right? What is right for us? And then next he said, what is right for our little ones? I want to tell you, all my family's married, but I cover them with prayer every day. Every day that goes by. And don't you think I don't tell them? I call, I said, Donnie, I prayed for you this morning, son. There's something you need. I don't know what it is, but, but the Lord showed me in prayer today. Be careful. And I'll call my children and tell them, Daddy prayed for you today. I want to fast and pray for my family. I don't want them to be lost. I don't want them to go to hell. How can you let your family go to hell and not fast and travail and pray before God? Then what? Fasting said, what is right for all of our substance? God's prospered us financially. James Jackson wrote a book, What You Gonna Do With What You Got? I heard him speak and it tore me out of my frame. What you going to do? I'm asking you, what are some of you going to do with what you got? You're sitting on a bundle and God's work is suffering. God's work is going like it. You need to fast for what is right. And verse 23 said, So we besought the Lord for this and He was entreated of us. What about it? I believe that. I'm going to ask you this morning, how many of you say, Brother Hughes, I want an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Notice, Verse 18 said that I will have I be jealous for the land and I will have pity upon the people. I want him to be jealous for me. I want him to have pity upon me. And then notice verse 21 said that he would do great things. And then in verse 23, be glad then ye children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God. And it shall come to pass afterward after I've met the conditions that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Amen. That's what it is. I, I want to know just how many of you want to just step right here with me and say, Brother Hughes, if God's looking for a candidate for an outpouring, He just located me. Will you just come and stand right here? Stand as closely as you can. 